Um, I actually wanted to kind of transition a little bit over into talking about sort of life on the base in, in Play Coup. Um, a daily life, what was that like? What would you do day to day? Well, most of the time I was there, I was the executive officer of the aviation unit. So I got up early in the morning. Uh, I'd go to the mess hall and eat. Um, then I'd go on up and sit in the old man's briefing. Um, commanding officer didn't care to do that. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting in a full bird colonel, group headquarters. I'm sitting in his briefing. So I'm hearing everything going on all over Vietnam, listen to all the latest intelligence reports, mm -hmm. everything else. And I have to report how many aircraft we have available today, how many hours of blade time we have available. Um, he's telling me that they have um, guns down at, say, Firebase 6 and uh, Ben Het, and we've got to get a mechanic out there to fix those. That got priority. Um, stuff like that so after that's over I'm going down to the base and we finally got a sergeant who's nothing to do with aviation mm -hmm. doesn't know anything about it but we got a staff sergeant E6 and he ran our operation for us and took care of paperwork and you'd come into our building down there and he'd have a whiteboard and he'd have all the bases and you tell him where you want to go he'd write you on the board and if we had a seat somewhere he put you in the seat because we had this Huey that we got every day. Mm -hmm. uh, the Chinooks and Cranes and that were always doing sling loads, so th they weren't taking anybody. And then we had all the other aircraft, the oh 08-6s, 08-58s, 23s. We had an extra seat put you in there, take you out to the base. And he was taking care of stuff like that. He also did flight following for us. Um, so if I'm leaving the base, going to play Durang before I land at play Durang, I call him, tell him I'm over play Durang, mark me down. And he'd flight follow and keep track of us, um, things like that. Um, and then I went to work. Um, but our unit, since it was different, they just figured they had so many aircraft. And when a full bird colonel tells a battalion commander what he's going to do, he says, yes, sir. So all the aircraft were put in this pool. And while a battalion commander may want a particular pilot, and he may say, I need an aircraft today. He got an aircraft today. And there was no argument, no nothing. You make sure he got an aircraft today. And um, he'd fly and go where he wanted to go. So the, old, the, the group commander decided early I was his pilot. Mm -hmm. I was a warrant. Um, that meant I had to stay at flight school. I wasn't partying every night. He mm -hmm. didn't want a hard bar. Mm -hmm. I was in my mid-20s. He wanted one that was married. I was single. I was the oldest warrant, mm -hmm. which also helped maybe settle me down a little yep. bit. The old man hoped so anyway. So I, I became his pilot. So if he wanted to go somewhere, I was reserved for him. And I waited until he'd come down and I flew him. Um, but then I'd fly whatever he put high priority to. There was one time I flew a kid that <coughs> <coughs> had to repair a bulldozer. Um, I was over there during the what they called the Vietnamization section where we were training Vietnam to take over more of the war mm -hmm. and uh, we were destroying some of the bases and a bulldozer was broke. So I flew this kid out to repair the bulldozer and the old man said he never flew before. He's scared to death to fly. He flew here in the Big Bird mm -hmm. but he, he's scared to fly so he said I want you to take him and, and I did um, and that was a lot of fun. Um, matter of fact I got him so relaxed I let him fly the aircraft part of the way <laughs> and when he was f through, f through repairing the bulldozer he says here you drive the bulldozer and I says I don't know a thing about a bulldozer he says we're tearing the base down you ain't got anything you can hurt <laughs> so I literally went right through a building with a bulldozer <laughs> but um, you know it was it's not all war mm -hmm. um, crazy part about war most people don't understand and you ask me about my day is that a lot of it's hurry up and wait, always. And I can remember after I'd been there, I don't know, about four or five months, something like that. When I first got there, we were getting hit two, three, four times a week. And by fourth, fifth month I was there, we might get hit once and then not get hit for a couple of weeks. And we were sitting around one night thinking about how many people had transitioned in, how many new people we had, what would they do if we got hit? Because um, we don't, because you're not dealing with old people that been through this mill. Mm -hmm. 
And we were talking about the old days when we scrambled with a shower shoes and a, and a towel wrapped around us because we happened to be in the shower. And, you, you know, common to Hollywood, you don't run back to your room and jump in your flight suit and put your socks on and put your boots on. And, you know, you, you don't do that. I mean, we, we'd get airborne and then we're talking to each other on the radio because we had a series of aircraft at our field. We'd be talking to everybody on the air once we got airborne and who's got an aircraft with time? Okay, and who's in full uniform? And, and then the rest was to go over to another base and sit on the runway and wait till this thing was over. And, you know, if you happen to be in full uniform, you were at the Oak Club and you were in full uniform, fine. If I was in shower shoes and sandals, I'm probably sitting over at Playco Air Base or over at Camp Holloway on the other side of town waiting for the battle at our base to, to, to end. Mm -hmm. And then I'll come back. And it was funny. It was... Uh, just a couple days later, <laughs> I ended up sitting over at Camp Holloway in a towel and flip-flops. <laughs> and not, Nothing looks funnier than a pilot with a helmet on, gloves on, chicken plate, survival vest, a Roman-type towel wrapped around mm -hmm. your waist and flip-flops. I mean, bare arms, you know, <laughs> just... <laughs> and you... You get a lot of comments from ground crews running around on the base doing mm. their thing, you know. <laughs> okay. So now what would you be hit with? Was it rockets or mortars or? Rockets, mortars. We got probed. Um, second week I was in Vietnam, they shot our barber in the barbed wire. Mm -hmm. He was sneaking in with satchel charges and not much more than a loincloth wrapped around his waist. And uh, Which is another interesting story because I ended up flying a Kit Carson scout. Um, they started shortly before I got to Vietnam, something called Chu Hoi Project, um, which I gather means um, surrender mm -hmm. or something similar to that in Vietnamese, but Chu Hoi. And they would come over, and most of the guys that Chu hoi were put back in the military, but they're put back in the South Vietnamese military. And they knew if they got caught, life wasn't going to be good for them. So they ended up being, by and large, the, the vast percentage of them end up being very, very loyal and very, very good soldiers. And we had one that was a sapper. And I flew him uh, with a commander at times out to some of these bases. And he'd take a look at the base. And he'd literally strip down to his underwear and he'd get a couple little pieces of bamboo sticks and put them in his... And he'd come through the barbed wire. And he'd come through the barbed wire about as fast as you think you could walk through it. And he'd show them where they're weak points were and where stuff was bad and stuff like that and and that was that was a real eye opener in an eyesight because while well, the commander would see him at this base uh, we had four and five battalions and each battalion's got uh, four or five gun batteries and or four or five companies mm -hmm. with four or five gun batteries in each company and so there's a lot of bases out there and I got to fly a lot of them and a lot of different commanders mm -hmm. and, not only the group commander, but a lot of the battalion commanders and stuff like that. And um, So I took this little Kit Carson scout to several different bases and stuff. And it was interesting. It was interesting talking with them and finding out a bit about how they lived and, and how the Viet Cong fought and things and, and, and different. Um, wife mentioned that I hadn't commented about uh, there was a hip shoot position out one time and uh, in the middle of the night, they thought they had movement in the barbed wire. So they put a couple flares up, and there's nobody. Of course, you can hear the mortar fire the flare. So this went on, and there's some more movement. And so they put two flares up, but one with a delay fuse and one with a short burn. So you, you fire the flares, but one lights. It goes out quick, short pause, and another one lights. Here's a Viet Cong standing in the barbed wire, mm -hmm. right in front of a duster, a 40 millimeter NA aircraft gun. Mm -hmm. And this thing had been mounted on tracks and was part of the perimeter support for this hip shoot. And they, they shot him. Um, so the next day, they make your intelligence report and stuff. And a few days later, they're making a sweep through the area. And I'm sitting in the old man's briefing every morning. They found where the guy had left his clothes and his pack and got his journal. And he had come down the Ho Chi Minh Trail with a whole bunch of sappers. 
and there were like two or three guys left with him and he, he that's all that was left. Mm -hmm. And these guys were low morale and he was going to teach them how to do this to get them around. He was a lieutenant. And I don't know what happened to the other two, but they, they didn't attack the, the perimeter. <laughs> I think they just decided the war was too much and quit. Mm -hmm. But um, interesting sidelight that, you know, that, it, it, as I look at the stuff we went through and what I was trained for, I can't imagine what it was like being on the other side. Mm -hmm. uh, down by Saigon, they found some places underground that were whole motor pools. I mean, parking area, mm -hmm. mechanic bays. They had tunnels that went clear back underneath the border going into Cambodia that they could literally drive a truck down. And I'm going, what? We found one north of Pleiku. If you read the book, The 13th Valley, the guy says that the story is fictitious. I've been in the valley. The big tree he talks about in the valley is there. I remember the battles that were there. Um, we found tunnels up there. They found the, the vent hole for mm -hmm. the tunnel. And you put a, what we call a uh, tunnel rat down the, valley, down the tunnel. And little guy in your unit, give him a 45 flashlight. He goes down this little tunnel. You don't know what you're going to find. You don't know what's in there. It could be booby trapped. It could be anything. But how far are you going to follow this trail? And I mean, if they got some of these tunnels that are long enough you can drive a truck in it, how, how far are you going to follow it? Well, he finally gave up, and they, we brought in, we flew in um, gas generators and generated CS. Mm -hmm. Now, people think that this is a, a, a gas, and it's not. It's a persistent powder. And we, persistent means that it stays there. It's there for days. Out. You don't go back in a week and it's disseminated. It's gone. Um, it's a persistent powder. So if you go down that tunnel a week later, you're going to stir up the gas. You're going to stir up the, the tear gas, and it's going to bother you. They pumped it in and pumped it in and pumped it in and pumped it in along with smoke and couldn't find any place where it was coming out. When they set the charges and blew it, they had a spot that just sunk, went for a mile or better, just dropped down and crazy stuff. That, and you wonder how. Um, underground hospitals, the same way. Um, Foot-operated suction pumps. Um, I don't know how. You know, I've listened to a lot of people complain about the VA. I've listened to a lot of people complain about our military. And we've got our problems. Still, it's the finest system in the world. With all its problems, it's still... And here we can complain about it. Mm -hmm. I don't know how well they could complain. <laughs> yeah. um, but I, I, I look at how hard we hit the Ho Chi Minh Trail. I look at um, the teams we put in that were working over the border, uh, special forces camps that were all up and down the border, and literally these mountain yards. This was their mm -hmm. backyard. You couldn't go through without leaving a sign you've been there. I don't know how. I don't know how the other side ever managed to fight and keep going. And I was there after Tet, and that's part of the reason we started getting nervous after several months and we weren't getting hit as hard. What are they saving this up for? Mm -hmm. When are we going to get hit with all this stuff? What, what are they doing? And we did have places that went under siege. Ben Het was up at uh, the tri-border area where Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam come together. And it was under siege for months and months and months and months. And when it started, uh, the Viet Cong planned everything out to just immense detail. They showed up with two P-76 tanks. These are the light amphibious mm -hmm. tanks. Of course, that's kind of dumb because we have artillery there and they just leveled their guns and used their direct fire sights and shot them like shooting any other tank and mm -hmm. it didn't make anything in the battle. But how do you get them in the jungle to that site for, for the battle? Mm -hmm. And they had went through choreographing this fight to such an extent that when it started within minutes, there were Viet Cong with satchel charges running around inside the compound 
They had dug tunnels underneath the barbed wire and brought them up inside the compound. We didn't know they were there. How do you do that? Hmm. I mean, I don't know. Um, you know. I take a look at and take my hat off to him. I mean, you want to talk about a soldier. I mean, we, we referred to him as Chuck, you know, uh, the VC, Viet Cong. Um, a lot of respect. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, uh